Again, it's good to see you and thankful again for this opportunity to study with you. Appreciate very much your presence as we do plan tonight to uh, continue in our, our studies in the book of Ephesians. So we invite you to turn there to the book of Ephesians while you do that. I'll mention a couple of things. Um, if I might, uh, uh, we do plan, as I'm sure Justin will tell us in a little bit, remind us we do plan to have our uh, prayer meeting tonight. You'd be welcome to stay as we uh, try to make a list of some folks that are especially on our minds and, and make special prayer for them. Um, and uh, we certainly believe in the power of prayer and believe that God will answer as he indeed knows best. So we appreciate uh, those who make that uh, part of their effort. If you're unable to be here but you have someone that you'd like mentioned, feel, please feel free to Pass that along to one of us, and we'll get that mentioned tonight. Um, also, I want to make mention of something we're quite excited about. Um, you know, we've been supporting uh, Gable Duke, his wife Abby, and their work up in Virginia. Uh, they're working in Charlottesville up there, and Larry Rouse is there as well. Uh, Gable is a young man, uh, but able fellow, and uh, he is devoted to the work of preaching. Uh, and uh, he is uh, going to be winding up his work up there this summer and would like to spend another year maybe working uh, uh, alongside uh, some other folks before maybe he gets out uh, uh, on his own at some place. And uh, he had offers to go to some other places, but uh, we'd ask him to come here, and he's agreed to come, he and Abby. And so maybe this, this summer, if the Lord wills, uh, he'll be able to come and be with us for a period of time. We're quite excited about that, um, and uh, we have got some details to work out, but uh, we are we're thrilled about that for various reasons. Uh, you know, Gable seems to think that maybe we can be of help to him, and I hope that's true, but I'm confident that uh, they can help us, um, and we have some ideas to put them to work. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we believe that they can help us in terms of you know, they've been doing a great deal of personal work up there, and they've uh, had some efforts that uh, have had some success. We're, we're excited to try here. Um, uh, and so uh, we believe that uh, that'll be a, a good thing and something that uh, we're, we're quite excited about. So please do pray for that effort, and uh, we'll give you updates as we get them and as details are worked out. But I think they'll make a great addition to the work here for the time they're here and believe that uh, uh, they'll be a great blessing to us. And I hope, as I said, we can be some blessing to them. I'm sure that you will uh, as we uh, uh, have that opportunity. Um, Ephesians has uh, been our study, our point of concentration. This is a book that's sort of been an adopted book for me for uh, a number of months. And uh, it's been a great blessing to me to go back through this book Every once in a while, I'm sure you're like this, you just try to say, okay, I'm going to read this book like I've never read it before, and I'm going to try to see if we can make some, uh, make some progress in our understanding of it. Ephesians, uh, the prison epistles, uh, I guess it's possible they could get lost in the, uh, in the, the, uh, the crowd here. Uh, it is a similar book to Colossians, and yet it's quite distinct in other ways. And um, this... Uh, this book is a book I heard Paul Earnhardt one time years ago say about Ephesians. It's a book that will stretch your mind. And I think the more I try to read it and, and the more I try to study it, the more I do appreciate what he meant by that. Uh, it begins with these words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about that opening and the power that's found there. We know where this letter is from. We know to whom it is written. And we know that he begin, bids them in the beginning, grace and peace, two powerful concepts. And then he starts with these words in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Uh, the book of Ephesians uh, is uh, maybe not a surprise, it's metaphorical, it's, it's rather a, a metaphysical in terms of its, uh, of its outlook. Uh, that expression there, the heavenly places, is one that has been intriguing to me for a long time. Maybe I still don't have a handle on it. But that word, uranios, the root word, 
he had translated uh, heavenly places most of the time in Ephesians in the old translation. Uh, I think it's found five times. It's found here, and it's found later on in chapter 1 and verse 20, um, talking about what God did, what he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. This is the place where Christ was raised to sit in his position, uh, his throne, as it were, the throne of David, as it might be referred to in other places, the, uh, the, the throne of power, ruling over his people. Uh, it's found again in chapter 2 and in verse 6, where we find that we are raised, to, made alive together with Christ, verse 5, and then verse 6, and it raised up us together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. And so Christ rules in the heavenly places, and we sit with Christ in heavenly places. And then in chapter 3 and in verse 10, to make all men see, verse 9, the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus to the intent that now of the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You know, here's the idea that, that God's great plan to save man from what seemed to be an insoluble problem. Uh, this, this idea of, uh, of how does a just God find a way to save a people that he loves but they're guilty as they can be and still be just. And, and the answer to that, we know, is the scheme of redemption or, or the, 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 really the gospel. And I'll tell you, it's not just men that marvel at it. It's, it's, the, it's the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Where are they? Well, they're not on earth exactly. But certainly they relate to the earth. But this is a, something beyond the earth. And, uh, and yet it's not heaven exactly. At least not to that phrase because it's not synonymous with it. Because when you read over in chapter 6 and verse 12, we notice how that our real fight, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high, heavenly, Uperanio, same word, places. There's a place, he says, where the real fight goes on. It's another level than just this world. It's not the, the, the guy that's tormenting you at work or the, 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 uh, the, the government official that's trying to make your life miserable because you're a Christian. That's not the real enemy. Oh, he's an enemy. But the real enemy is in the heavenly places. And that's where Christ rules. And that's where we reign with him. And that's where the spiritual blessings are. And that's why, you know, here's a guy and he's, uh, he doesn't have a pot of money. He doesn't live in a big house. But he has every blessing that counts. Because God doesn't just see the physical. And that's not what's ultimately the real thing. Those things are transient and temporary. But the things that we don't see, Paul said, are eternal. So the first thing I think he does in the first just few words of this letter is he really takes us to a different place and reminds us we are the most blessed people on the earth. And you might look at somebody's house or some, what they're driving or if they're walking and you might think, surely not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in every way that counts. Couldn't be more serious. This fellow has, understood, has found out what's real and what's eternal, and that's what he holds to, and that's the God that blesses him. So we said this, but we'll say it probably more than one time, more than two times. When I think about Ephesians, I think about Ephesians fitting pretty well into two compartments, and good students have noticed this a lot longer uh, than I've been preaching and teaching. And they point out how the, the, the last three chapters really speak to our duty as a Christian. And so he says in chapter 4, verse 1, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. You've got to get busy fulfilling the calling that God called you with. The old translation uses the word vocation. I think that's a great word. What is our vocation? Our vocation is our work. Our avocations are a hobby, right? But our vocation is our work. That's what we've got to be responsible to do. 
Uh, and I'll tell you, when it comes to the work of a Christian, it involves living a life of purity. Not like the Gentiles walk. Not like they live. Not like they think. Paul says it there in Ephesians 4. He said, you have not so learned Christ. I have heard just this week, we plan to have some more things to say about this later. And, and, I, and I mean this with, with no disrespect to anybody. There are folks that I love and people that I have a lot of respect for. And their children have walked away from the faith. And they've gotten involved in all kinds of, of wickedness. Wickedness that is detestable to anybody who's listened to Christ. And, uh, and, and yet the world praises them for it. And we have, we have, we have somehow... We, we find young people who turn away from the gospel and they let TikTok be their, their God and their counselor. And they're headed for misery. And they want to hear none of it. You know, I, 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 my heart breaks about that. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that. And it makes us all the more careful, I think, to try to talk to the young people that may listen to us and find out where they are and what they're thinking and why and how. But, you know, all through my life in preaching and teaching, I've done a lot of preaching and teaching out of the last four chapters of Ephesians because it's very practical material about what the old man is and what the new man is and this is moral and this is immoral and be it so. But don't you think that the Holy Spirit's purpose in laying out this letter as he did and giving it to Paul as he did and to us as he did is to help us understand that if, if the gospel is just a rule book to you and just a do not and do kind of list, it's probably not going to be nearly enough that what you really need to understand is who you are in God's sight. And if you get that, then you're not going to be terribly resistant to the call to step away from the world and to live a different life. And he starts off in Ephesians by just helping us understand how blessed we are and how special you are. If you're a child of God and you hear me tonight, I'm telling you, all spiritual blessings are yours. And the sad reality is that there are some people, and, and Lord help us, there are some folks who just don't see the spiritual at all. They, they, they are carnal in their thinking. They are tied up so much in this world that they, they just refuse to see how God wants to, to bless them, how God has blessed them. And they throw things that are eternal away for things that are temporary and they're really destructive and vain at best. So Paul begins with that point. I want you to know how blessed you are and how special you are and where you sit in the heavenly places with Christ. But tonight, I want to move on to the next point that I think Paul makes. Not only are we the blessed, but we are the chosen. That applies to all of us. You know, limited as I am, I am one of the chosen of God. He has chosen people. Look with me again in Ephesians 1 and in verse 4 beginning. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of, his glory, of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes young Christians may read this, or maybe some not so young, and they might be rather confused, and they might read words like, like predestination. Predestined? Chosen before the foundation of the world? I didn't think that I, I didn't think we believed in predestination, somebody says. Well, it depends on what you mean. You know, something has been predetermined here. We're 
chosen before the foundation of the world. That is true. The Holy Spirit says it. But what does he mean by that? I'm convinced of this. He does not mean what we so often hear in the Protestant world from some prominent teachers who believe that this passage teaches and some others teach that God before the foundation of the world picked without any forethought of what someone might do or choices they might make, those who are going to be saved and those who are going to be lost, and thus they will be saved or lost based upon that, and really there's nothing they can do about it. Um, I'm not exaggerating that, by the way. Westminster Confession of Faith, this is a document written back in the 1640s uh, that became the foundation of the old Presbyterian doctrine and the Calvinist teaching, which reads, by the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. And these angels and men thus predestinated and foreordained are particularly and unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite it cannot be either increased or diminished. Uh, a more modern uh, Calvinistic teacher, uh, R.C. Sproul, I think he's died recently, but a uh, very popular fellow, wrote a lot of books. A lot of people think he's a great teacher, and, and he once made this point. He said, God does not foresee an action or a condition on our part that uh, induces him to save us. And so whatever choice he makes, it has nothing to do with anything we say or do or decide. It is simply God says, this one's saved and this one's lost. John MacArthur, still a popular teacher, of the same school, who wrote, the doctrine of election simply means that God, uninfluenced and before creation, predetermined certain people to be saved. God didn't draw straws. He didn't look down the corridor of time to see who would choose him before he decided. So why does God still find fault in unrepentant sinners when he didn't choose them? That is a good question, isn't it? Let me again emphasize this point. I, this, is a, uh, this is a commentary on Romans written by a guy named Hamilton. And uh, in, uh, in his commentary, he, he writes about the same point. He says that God arbitrarily chooses some for salvation. He's rather bold, isn't he? He says we have no way of knowing why God selects the particular individuals whom he chooses to save rather than others, but that choice is in no way contingent on anything in the character or deeds of those who are saved, nor in the acceptance of the offer of salvation. God does not tell us why he selects some for salvation rather than others, but there is no injustice involved in such choice because it is the sovereign act of one who has the right to show mercy upon whom he will show mercy. Well, I don't know if everybody's quite as injudicious as this fellow is, but that's what they believe. And so when they talk about predestination, that's what they mean. They mean that God, before the world began, selected that Joe's going to be saved, Wes is going to be lost, and there's nothing they can do about it, and so Wes going to hell, Joe's going to heaven, and that's predestination in the common parlance. That is insane to me. Now, going on with Mr. MacArthur, he says, uh, how these two sides of God's truth, his sovereignty in choosing us, Romans 9, and our responsibility to confess and believe, Romans 10, reconcile is impossible for us to understand fully. Well, he's right about that. It is impossible to reconcile their teaching about God with what the Bible says about salvation. He mentions Romans 9. We got our hands full in, in, in Ephesians. But I feel like since we're bringing this subject up, it is only fitting that we just take a moment to look over in Romans chapter 9. This is another of the key texts by these fellows in which they think they find their doctrine. That God before the foundation of the world, one fellow said, arbitrarily selects some to be saved and some to be lost. Now think about that. There are millions of people who believe that. That is a tenet of the old traditional Calvinistic Presbyterian doctrine. Uh, and I'll tell you, to them, it's silly to believe otherwise. 
Because they think that, that God's sovereignty is at stake here. And that, uh, you know, to suggest for a moment that uh, you have a part in salvation is to rob God of his sovereignty. In fact, it robs him of his glory. You can't uh, uh, possibly come to God and thank him for salvation if you're the one who's doing it. Now, that's a, a misrepresentation of what's going on, but that's what they believe. So in Romans chapter 9, you do find some, some expressions here. Uh, he talks about a potter and a clay. Uh, and his clay, and he, he, he talks about how that, uh, you know, the, the, the thing formed, you know. Can he say to the one that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Um, he talks about those uh, vessels of wrath, verse 22, fitted for destruction. Uh, he, he points out how that uh, it was said about uh, uh, Esau, you know, the story of Esau and Jacob, that Esau, I've hated, Jacob, I've loved, and he points out how that uh, those children not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God might be election. Or the election might stand, I should say, and not of works, but of him that calleth. Does this passage teach what these fellows are trying to make it out to teach? Well, if you read it and read it carefully, what you find is that's not at all the case. You go back to verse 1 of, of, of Romans 9. Where does Paul start here? Well, of course, he starts in chapter 1. <laughs> And the whole book of Romans really is taken up with this idea. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And if this were a class, I'd ask you to answer out, what's the next line? To the Jew first and also the Greek. So the book of Romans is a book about salvation, in particular about how God saves Jew and Greek on the same basis, same gospel, and that is the gospel of Christ. Why is that so important? Why is that such a big deal? Read the gospel, read the, uh, I should say, the, uh, the letter to the Galatians. And we find here a church just eaten up with this false teaching that somehow it's not enough to be a Christian. You've got to be a Jew to be a Christian. And so the gospel can only go to a world in which people are willing to become Jews first, and then, then you can find Christ. Christ is not enough. Paul says that's an, a, 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 a damnable teaching. Uh, and really the book of Romans is just an expanded argument of the same point that he makes to the churches of Galatia. That is that we're saved by the grace of God and by the blood of Christ, and that's true for all men, Jew and Greek. Now Paul in Romans 9 points out his heartbreak over those who were of the same Jewish heritage he was because they were lost and they had rejected that gospel. I say the truth in Christ, he begins in line up, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. I wish that uh, myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen in the flesh. It breaks his heart that the, Jew, that the, uh, the Israelites have for the most part been rejected by God. Why were they rejected? Because they refused to accept Jesus. He talks about who are these people? They're those to whom pertains the adoption, verse 4, and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Blessed as they were, they were still rejected. Do you think that God chose before the foundation of the world they wouldn't be saved? He had tried everything to save them. And he decided before the foundation of the world <clears throat> there was no hope for these people? That they had no uh, uh, opportunity? Hardly. The opposite is true. It's not that the word of God has taken none effect. It's that many who claim Israelite heritage are not Israelites spiritually. And whose choice is that? Their choice. Neither because, verse 7, they are the seed of Abraham or are they all children. And Paul makes the point he says, for the Jew who feels so proud about his heritage, uh, he said, actually, the whole reason why they were ever special is because God was bringing a Savior into the world. And that Savior couldn't come through every family. So God chose the family of Abraham. And then he chose Isaac. And then he chose Jacob. When he talks about Jacob I have loved and Esau I hated. He's not talking about one was saved and one was lost. The context would be that here was the family of Jacob 
that was chosen to be the one through whom the Messiah would come. But here's the point. The Messiah that came would be a savior for the whole world. Jew and Gentile. And isn't it ironic that the Jew, having been blessed as he has by God, would now object that, that the Gentile might also be so blessed. God makes a good bit of, Paul makes a good bit of point in this passage about God's choices. And he has the right to choose. He has the right to use certain men. He used Pharaoh, verse 17. The scripture says uh, unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God made a choice, but he didn't do that arbitrarily. We could go back to the book of Exodus in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 15, among other places. And remember that story about God and Pharaoh and the Exodus. You remember how that it was because of Pharaoh's pride. Exodus chapter 8, I think it is in verse 15. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Exodus 8, 15. When Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, that is, from the plague of the frogs, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord said. God didn't force Pharaoh to do anything wrong. He never forces any man to do wrong. But God used a proud man to gain glory over Egypt and over the gods of Egypt. Now that's God working through men. But there's not one thing in Romans 9 that would suggest that God somehow forced anybody to do wrong or anybody to do right, for that matter. And so uh, he, he talks about the potter and the clay and uses that illustration. It harkens back to the book of Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. Look in Jeremiah chapter 18. I think this is worth noting. And I hope if um, uh, it's, it's something, maybe you have a note in your Bible about this matter. This is where uh, Jeremiah tells the, uh, is told uh, by the Lord, the, this, the, this illustration of the potter and the clay. He tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house, verse 2, and I will cause thee to hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. <clears throat> and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so that he make it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom? Notice, to pluck it up and pull it down and destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it and to plant it. If I do evil, if it do evil in my sight uh, and uh, obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith uh, I said I would benefit them. And so he says to, to Judah, Return everyone from his evil way. When he talks about the potter and the clay, he's not suggesting that God makes someone evil or makes them good. It suggests that the potter has the right to react and he has the right to do what he sees is right. And so the same point might be made in Romans chapter 9, that God has the right to now reject the Jews because they had rejected Christ. And he has the right to accept the Gentiles because they accepted Christ. That's the very point that he concludes with. Look in verse 31. We're back in Romans 9 now. Romans 9 and verse 31. Uh, verse, let me start with verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. Not because God before the foundation of the world said, you're lost and you're saved. It was because God reacted to their choices. He has the right to do that. 
just as surely as the potter has power over the clay. But God is not unrighteous, and he's not uh, one who uh, <clears throat> is uh, partial, but fair. And he gives to man that which is right, and his mercy is extended on that basis. And so that's really what Romans 9 is about. It's not at all what these fellows are claiming it to be. And so that's the problem with Mr. MacArthur's point there. He says, well, in Romans 9, God is arbitrary. In Romans 10, what does he say? He says, you must believe. You must confess. I don't know how to reconcile that. I do. Get the right interpretation of Romans 9. There's not a contradiction. With all these fellows, and they're smart guys, but I tell you, to me, the, the matter simply comes down to this question. Does God want all men to be saved or not? If you're a Calvinist, they say, absolutely not. God showed for the foundation of the world that Jim, Joe, and Jerry, they're going to be lost, and there's nothing they can do about it, and the number of those lost folks is already set, and it's so certain, nothing can change it. it has nothing to do with what they'll ever do. They've just chosen to be lost. How can you believe such a thing? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul describes God as, as the one who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Or in 2 Peter chapter 3, that God is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3, 16. What does that often quoted passage tell us? Whosoever will, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Those kinds of invitations would be nonsense if God had already determined that these folks are going to be lost and there's nothing that can change that. The Calvinists are not holding to Scripture as they think they are. They think they're defending the sovereignty of God. They're doing no such thing. They're making nonsense of God. They're making a, a monster out of God who sends men to hell on no basis that we can see at all and certainly completely outside of their control. Contrast that with passages like Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. This takes us back to the household of Cornelius and the great sermon that was preached there. Peter opened his mouth and began with these words, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respect of persons, but in every nation... He that God is already predetermined. No, that's not what it says. It says, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Or in Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 7, uh, Paul again writes, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Notice, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now that's a very simple fundamental principle. But it, it's nonsense, it seems to me, if Calvinism is accepted as true. God's sovereignty does not exclude our choice. In Colossians chapter 1, the sister letter to the letter we're studying in Ephesians, uh, in Colossians chapter 1, notice this language. Verse 21, And you who were sometimes aliens, alienated, I should say, and enemies in your mind by wicked works hath he now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now look at verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am a minister. And we've talked about that the other day. Brother Blue used to say that was the biggest little word in the Bible. I'm sorry. Yeah, the biggest little word in the Bible was the word if. If. God says that you will be reconciled and, and, and be uh, blessed if you continue in the faith. To the Calvinist, it's already been settled before the world begins. Each individual soul salvation is already determined by what one fellow called the arbitrary instruction of God or decision of God. That, that's just 
completely unbiblical. Well, if all that's true, we still got to explain what is he talking about here in Ephesians when he talks about how we're, in some sense, chosen before the foundation of the world. If it's not that, then how do we explain it? I got four minutes. Surely we can cover that four minutes. Actually, I don't think it's that complicated. Uh, that we should be, he says, holy and without blame before him in love. I think that the way that, that, that the Bible explains this is by explaining not that God has decided each individual's destiny, if you want to use that word, regardless of what they will do or have done, but rather that God had in mind a people. He had in mind a people who would be holy and without blame. Children that would be adopted into his family. I remember uh, somebody ask, uh, I think it was Sewell Hall one time, that old question, we probably all heard it, maybe we've thought about it, maybe we've been asking. And that is, you know, can you explain in, 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 in brief terms why in the world God would choose to create man? <laughs> as much trouble as we are, as flawed as we are, as much as we've cost him? <laughs> how, how do you explain that? And, uh, you know, that seems like a pretty good question from one angle. But I, Brother Hall went to Romans 8, uh, and uh, he said he thought this might be the closest thing he could find in the Bible to answering that question. Romans 8, 29 reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, we might ask this question. Why in the world would you ever have children? You know, people plan to have children. Sometimes they're just blessed that way. Sometimes they go out and adopt them. Why would you do that? I guess because you just don't like to sleep at night. I reckon that's all I can think about. You got too much money. You just don't know what to do with it, so you need some. Well, it'd be sad if that's all we thought of children, wouldn't it? But actually, every parent in this room, I have confident knows why. We do that because we, we want someone to love. And I think that's the case with God. God made us that we might, uh, as Acts 17 says, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He wants us to be his adopted own, that he might love us and that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now that's what God foresaw, and that's what he predestined, a people. A people that would be holy and a people that would be without blame. And I believe the Bible teaches that he gives to all men the opportunity to be a part of that number. He doesn't force individuals to be saved or lost, but he has foreseen a people that will be pure and holy and take on the divine nature and live with him forever. And he extends to all his, his, uh, his, uh, his human creatures the opportunity to be in that number. And then it's our choice whether we will or we won't. But it certainly is his vision. He knows what he wants. It's, this is not uh, an exact illustration. And if it doesn't help you, just dismiss it. But I, I've thought of it being something like <clears throat> The fellow who puts the want ad in the paper, or whatever people do for the paper now. And the guy says, well, this is what I'm looking for. I'll train you, but if you're willing to work and you realize you need money, then you can come to me and I'll help you out and I'll put you to work. And he knows what he wants to wind up with. Now, he may not choose each individual by name. He's chosen instead what he wants. And I think that's the case with us in the ultimate sense. God has predestined a people, and he has invited you and I to be a part of that number. And as we have accepted that, we are a part of that chosen number. And what a blessing that is. That's the sovereign God who sets the terms. Our Calvinist friends at this point perk up and they say, you're robbing God of his glory when you do this. 
Oh, you, you're giving man the glory. I'm doing no such thing. Let, let's be clear about something so obvious it's a shame we have to say it. No man ever went to God first. We were the ones drowning. And it's God who before the world began not only uh, had a vision, a plan to, uh, uh, to receive a people, but a plan to cleanse us. And so he always makes the first move. He's always there before us. We never go to God first. All the glory goes to him. He's made it all possible. It makes no more sense to think that a man who responds to the grace of God is to be patted on the back than it does the man who's rescued from drowning, who gets back on the shore after people have risked their lives to save him and says, you see how I grabbed that, that life preserver? Boy, I was, I'm a, some kind of hero, I guess. That's ridiculous. It's all the glory to God. But I'll tell you that that God is not a God who condemns anybody that didn't deserve it and that didn't ultimately refuse his invitation. It could have been different. Whoever wills, let him take of the water of life freely. He doesn't force men then to be saved any more than he forces them to be lost. All the blame is upon us if we fail to take advantage of the great grace of God. All that are saved are saved according to his provision, the provision of his will. And it's all to the praise of his glory. It's amazing how many times you find that expression just in the first few verses of this book. It's a key theme. To God be the glory. Amen. It's his plan in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In verse 9 of chapter 1, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Verse 11, in whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. The choice to believe is going to be yours and mine. But the glory is his. He's the Savior. It's his plan. And the amazing accomplishment that any human being could be saved is to his credit, not ours. Verse 12 of chapter 1. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, talking about the Spirit, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Talking, I think, about the resurrection there. And then in verses 7, the latter part of 7 and 8, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I think the wisdom and insight there are God's. The amazing God that we serve came up with a plan to save us from our own doing. The, the God that we serve had the insight to work this plan through history and to bring about the Savior that all men might be saved. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Okay, we'll stop there and uh, we'll uh, pick up again uh, next time. Uh, with the, uh, our study in Ephesians. I appreciate your patience. I invite your questions. If you think I've missed the point, please feel free to talk to me about that. And if I've not dealt with a question, uh, I hope you'll likewise uh, help me with that as well. But I, I do believe this, that Ephesians is a great gift of God. And the more I try to read it and the more I, I meditate on it, I think the more I do appreciate the wisdom of God and in reference to ourselves, the great blessing we have as Christians, we have all spiritual blessings in Christ, and we are the chosen of God. We are a part of that number that he will later in this same chapter call his inheritance. What a great gift that is. I appreciate your kind attention. If you haven't already, take your songbook, turn to the number that's been selected. If you're here tonight 
and you're not a part of this number, I'll tell you, it is not because God hadn't invited you. Don't wait. Don't tell him no. Come forward. Come in penitence. Come with a heart full of faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Come and confess his name. Come and be baptized into Christ. If you've done that, but you've not lived that new life that, that, that you were called to live, make correction of that. The world has nothing for you but death and misery and disappointment. So come back to him, and he longs to receive you. And if we can help you, we want to. Let us know how right now, please, while we stand, while we 